Well, good morning. Welcome to another Daily Nuggets of Wisdom. Uh, welcome to another Daily Nuggets of Wisdom. I am uh, seeking to provide some wisdom and some practical steps on how to deal with anxiety, depression, uh, suicidal thoughts, and so on. So, good morning, Allison. Good to see you. Uh, so, I am going to seek to jump into the subject very quickly today. Again, the topic we're dealing with is anxiety, depression, and uh, suicide. And more and more, uh, this is becoming more and more prevalent throughout our world. And so, uh, today I'm going to be looking at Psalm 77, because maybe uh, you're not aware that all throughout the scriptures that this topic is a struggle that uh, God's people have, have had to deal with. And uh, by the way, to feel anxiety and discouragement and depression is not always a bad thing if, if it draws us closer to God. If it makes you dependent upon God, if it causes you to go to Him for help, good morning, Roberta, good to see you, then that's a good thing. All right, so uh, we're going to talk about how to have victory over depression and uh, these type things. I'm going to give you some practical tips today. Uh, but the first thing I want to do is look at Psalm 77 and uh, show you some of the causes and, uh, the, and, and uh, biblical cures for cure, that's a good word, for depression. So I'm going to begin with prayer. And if you are home and able to get your Bible, then I'll be in Psalm 77. All right. So um, you've been battling in and out of discouragement last couple of weeks. How many of you have been dealing with what are, you know, since, since I have you guys on, good morning, Fran, good to see you. Uh, what, um, you know, what are some of the things that the practical things that you do or have done to deal with depression or discouragement? Uh, because it's normal, we all deal with it at different levels, right? So, so just go ahead and type in there some of the things that you have done. And what are some of the longest, longest periods that you've dealt with? Um, Depression or discouragement or um, uh, feeling downcast. You know, what are some of the longest periods that you've dealt with it? And what are some of the things that you have done or, or do to help you get out of it? Good morning, Carolee. Good to see you this morning. While you guys go ahead and answer that question, or my two questions, I'm going to go ahead and pray. And uh, But I'll be in Psalm 77. But uh, yeah, I would definitely love to hear from you uh, if you have dealt with depression or discouragement or found that you have seasons of dealing with it, what are some of the things? Worship, crying out to God, pray, prayer and the word. Okay, yeah. You know, um, I believe people who, um, I'll, I'll just say this, that, that one of the answers for dealing with depression and discouragement is singing. Singing. Um, I believe if you're not a person, person who has learned how to get emotional, about God, then that's a vacuum, a part of your, your life that will be filled with other things, or uh, you'll feel a sense of emptiness, all right? So worship, uh, in this case, worship and song is very, very, very important. I come across a lot of old people with depression. I always always pray, pray to try to encourage them and give them scriptures to, uh, to read. Yeah, that's very important. So, um, so, all right, I'm going to pray. Uh, we're in Psalm 77, and uh, uh, the psalmist in the day of trouble begins. Psalm 77 begins with verse 1. He says, I cried unto God with my voice, even unto God with my voice, and he gave ear unto me. In the day of my trouble, I sought the Lord. In the day of my trouble, I sought the Lord. Um, my sore ran in the night and ceased not. And then here's an interesting phrase. This gives you an idea of, uh, the state of the psalmist, he says, my soul refused to be comforted. That's a, that's kind of um, that's a kind of sorrow that a person is dealing with that can lead to a state of depression. All right, so we're going to look at some of the causes and and cures, biblically speaking, for depression. Let me begin with prayer. Father, I want to thank you this morning for the privilege to be able to look into the scriptures. We pray that you will open your word to our hearts today that you would be glorified, Lord, that you will grant wisdom from on high, and that, Lord, you would, uh, even now I'm asking you to wash and cleanse me from all sin, from all iniquity, every transgression, any and everything in my life that's not like you, I'm asking you to remove it. Anything that would hinder, Lord, your word from going forth, be glorified this day in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Uh, Doshel, you say, music has always uplifted my spirit, instrumental as well as vocal. Yeah. Music is a major key. Uh, if you remember that um, there's a time in the, in the Old Testament where Saul, King Saul, had uh, was afflicted and um, by a, a demonic, an evil spirit, and and David was able to play music that drove that evil spirit away, and uh, so that's a very very important thing. So mo most people know what depression is, at, at least of some some kind. Even though I said yesterday that I think the term is used very loosely, uh, people use it to describe feeling sadness, a, a, a period of grief. Uh, the term is used very, very, um, very loosely. But uh, and I don't think everyone who believes they're depressed is depressed. But but it's you know if someone feels gloomy, you know that that's that's they tend to to describe that as feeling depressed. And the only reason I don't use the term so easily is because to me when I when I hear that someone's depressed, that sounds like a state of of mind, a state of being, right? It, it, to me, it's not just a a moment of feeling sadness. Um, so for you, Allison, you say it's for seasons. I pray and listen to positive thinking workshops and so on. Okay. And, uh, and those things help you. So, so I'm going to, I'm going to seek to give you guys some, some cures today. So I, I don't believe you have to deal with depression all your life, but I do believe that, uh, that we're whole beings, body, soul, and spirit. And, uh, just as we have to, um, we have to train our bodies physically. We have to train our minds as well. And when you you have been used to dealing with depression and you and you have adjusted to it as a normal part of your life, then um, your mindset, your mind has to be changed, but has to be renewed. Because once you've been, your mind has been trained that this is normal. Uh, it's hard not to accept it. Uh, as as a normal way. So the first thing I want you to notice is that depression affects us in at least four ways. Looking at the text of Psalm 77, the first thing I want you to notice is first of all, the psalmist describes being feeling overwhelmed in his spirit, being overwhelmed in spirit. If you notice in verse three, in verse three he says, "I remembered God and was troubled. I complained and my spirit was overwhelmed." Selah. Now that word Selah there means to stop and pause, right? So this is a, for the psalmist, this is a very serious state of being. So one of the, way that, one of the ways that people are affected by depression, it is seen in a person's life, is uh, there's, a, there's a sense in which your, your spirit is overwhelmed. So the psalmist tells us in verse 3 that his spirit, his spirit was overwhelmed. Uh, one definite, one dictionary definition of depression is a lowering, a lowering of the spirit. So how often, how often some of us have experienced this for some, some reason, and sometimes people can't identify why they feel this way. There's a sense where the spirit has been defeated, dejected, and overwhelmed. And here the psalmist describes himself, himself. It's interesting. He says, I remembered God and was troubled. I complained and my spirit was overwhelmed. My spirit was overwhelmed. Um, so whatever is going on here with the psalmist and his reflections and his thinking, um, I think it's directly connected. He says, I remembered God and was troubled. So what is he remembering about God? Maybe uh, this could be tied to uh, sometimes in a person's life, past sin or discouragement, something that's happened in your life. Uh, but, but it's connected here to memory. I remembered God and was troubled. I complained and my spirit was overwhelmed. Selah. I was amazed or confounded by the thoughts that came upon me, the psalmist says. So one of the things we see here in scripture is a, a sense where the spirit is overwhelmed. Secondly, um, in verse 6, the psalmist says, I call to remembrance my song in the night. I commune with my own heart, and my spirit made diligent search. In verse 6, the psalmist tells us that in this time of discouragement or depression for him, he remembered the times when he had been able to sing, even in the night. But he's not able to sing now. He says, I call to remembrance my song in the night. I commune with my own heart, and my spirit made diligent search. 
Uh, he goes on to talk about how he was unable to, he's unable to sleep. In verse, in verse 4, if you skip, if you go up to verse 4, he says, Thou holdest mine eyes waking, I am so troubled that I cannot speak. And that's the way of, that's the psalmist way of describing himself, of not, uh, not being able to sleep at night. And these are some of the symptoms for people who deal with, with uh, depression. And you know, um, he goes on to say, I'm so troubled that I cannot speak. Inability to, uh, to talk about what's going on. Sometimes these are things that, that people deal with. So what should you do? What are some of the causes for this? Notice in verse 2 of, of, of Psalm 77, he says, In the day of trouble I sought the Lord, my, my sore ran in the night and ceased not. My soul refused to be comforted. My soul refused to be comforted. This person is in a state of, of morbid, uh, there is a, a sense of pessimism here. This outlook, this pessimistic outlook on life that, that the psalmist refuses, refuses to be comforted. Some people are full of pessimism, uh, thinking and speaking. And, uh, uh, you, know, uh, you know, if you, you think of, 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 of a keyboard, there, is the, there are those bright keys. When you play those bright keys, they're considered the optimistic keys. Then there is the pessimistic, the minor keys. They're like the pessimistic ones. There's the major keys, which are real bright and have nice sound. Well, there is, are sometimes in a person's life, and this is the case of the psalmist, for this period, he says, in the day of trouble, I sought the Lord. And then he goes on to say, my soul refused. My soul refused to be comforted. Have you ever felt like that, where your soul refuses to be comforted? By the way, a, a big important key in dealing with discouragement, depression, and anxiety is the will. The will. You have to strengthen your will, your willpower, because sometimes you don't feel like doing what you know you have to do. And so here the psalmist, the psalmist says his soul refused to be comforted. Uh, in verse 3, uh, he talks about how his conscience, his conscience was, was um, um, even though he remembered God, that he, he was so troubled. Listen to his words. I remembered God and was troubled. I complained and my spirit was overwhelmed. I, as you go through this psalm, you, you hear a man that is completely overwhelmed and um, weighed down. And I'm going to quickly, because I think many of you know how you know some of these feelings. You know, what are some of the things that we should do when we're dealing with, with, um, with depression and discouragement? Well, one of the first things I think you need to do is um, you need to get into uh, dealing with. Hey, Joel. Morning. Good morning. Good to see you. Um, let's talk about how to have victory over these things: depression and discouragement. First of all, a lot of this comes from stress, right? The world is full of stress. The Bible says that even the creation in Romans chapter 8 is under a state of stress, right? The world, the, the earth is groaning. That's why we have earthquakes. I don't know if you knew that, right? We have earthquakes and all these different things that happen in the earth because the earth is under the, um, under the burden of sin. And uh, listen to how the Bible describes it here. Um, let's see if I can... It says in, um, listen to Romans 8, verse 18. Paul says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time, the sufferings of this present time, are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. Uh, verse 21, he says, The creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption, into the glorious liberty of the children of God. In other words, that's the Bible's way of saying that, that the earth itself is groaning and it's waiting for the day uh, for, for, the, for the children of God to be glorified. But verse 22 says, For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Together with who? Together with God's, with us. The earth, the earth, and this is an important truth to get. To get, the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain, like a woman in childbirth, travailing in childbirth. God describes the whole earth 
as travailing in pain together with us until now. What's the point here? Suffering is normal. Stress is normal. Trial is normal. Difficulty is normal. And you have to embrace it as normal or you'll continue to be overwhelmed by, by stress. And you need to learn how to identify these things in your life. Right? Um, you have to because our hearts are deceitful and desperately wicked. Right? And, uh, and that's not just dealing with the problem of sin. It also deals with the problem of discouragement and, and, and depression and anxiety. Um, because our own hearts can deceive us. And so, let me give you a couple practical things. The first thing I want to recommend, that if you're dealing with discouragement and depression, the first, one of the first things I think you need to do is, uh, and you may not think this is an important one, you need to renew, the mind needs to be renewed. And renewing the mind is a continual process. It's not something that you do once. It's not something that you do like, you know, oh, 10 years ago I became a Christian, so my mind was renewed. No. The idea of renewing the mind is a continual process, right? Because the Bible describes us uh, as being in a war. And we're in a, we're in a war with the world, the flesh, and the devil. Maybe you're not aware of this, but you're in a war with the world. And so God says in Romans 12, 1, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies, your bodies, your brain, your mind is part of the body, right? Present your bodies, a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world. And so I want you to think there's a translation of the Bible that describes, that says, says it this way. Don't allow the world to press you into its mold. The world can affect the way you think. Right? So if you're going to deal with depression, discouragement, anxiety, the first thing I'm saying you have, you have to do is the most basic thing that you and I are commanded to do, and that is that we are to be renewed in our minds. Now, the first 11 chapters of Romans goes through all the good things that God has done for his children, right? From chapter 1 to chapter 11, it deals with all these great things that God has done. We've been justified by faith and, um, and, 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 all, and, and how we've been sanctified and set apart to God and all, this, all these great things that God has done. And Paul describes these things as the great mercies of God. And he now says to this group of believers, he says, Therefore, brethren, I beseech you by the mercies of God. Think of all that God has done for you. And the least you can do now is give him your body. Present it, present it as a living sacrifice. The idea of to present, this, the tense of this is this, this is something you should do regularly. You should do this over and over and over again. All right, And so it's going to take effort if you're going to deal with discouragement and depression and anxiety. If you are laying back waiting to be zapped by God, waiting for the feeling to lift, waiting for the heaviness to go away, waiting for the feeling of being downcast to just leave you, you're going to stay in that state a lot longer. You're going to have to have a, a mentality of one who is in war if you're going to deal with discouragement, depression, feeling downcast, grief, sorrow, all these things. Why? Because this one, it's normal in life, and it's not going to go away unless you are willing to fight against it. And so you, it says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. How does transformation in any area of life take place? It takes place by the renewing of the mind. So the promise that you and I have here from God for renewing our minds is that we will be transformed. We will be changed, made new. Now, just think about it. Let's imagine for a moment that you've been dealing with discouragement and depression for 10 years. Maybe you've come to a point where you have accepted this as, as a normal part of your life. If you have, I want to say to you, don't accept it as a normal part of life. When I say accept it as normal, stress is normal. Feelings are normal. But a state of mind of depression continually is not normal. That is abnormal. Now, it may be normal for America, and that's an interesting study, right? The amount of Americans that deal with depression and discouragement, chemicals in the food, chemicals in your shampoos, chemicals in your deodorant, chemicals in, in, in the vaccines, chemicals in your lotions, chemicals in, in everything, and you know, all these chemicals are going to affect the state of being, your, your mind, right? So you're going to have to learn about what it is you're taking in, what you're, I don't know, most people, most people I talk to are not aware of this. I don't know if, you're, if you know this. Do you know that your skin is an organ? It's an organ. 
and that anything you apply to your skin, ladies, this is why you have a lot more challenges than men because you're always makeup and lots of stuff, always applying. You need to know what's in the stuff that you're putting on. Why? Because your skin is an organ. And um, the, the majority of what you're applying to your skin can enter into your bloodstream. And that is going to affect your state of mind. It's going to affect your state of being. It's going to affect your health. You don't believe this is true? When I was growing up, they used to have patches. I don't know if they still do it, but they would, in a way, they, they wanted to help people deal with uh, smoking. And so what would they do? They would apply a patch to the stomach area, and uh, people could keep that on all day. And, and the, the, there's certain thing, chemicals from the patch that would enter into the body, eventually into the bloodstream, and it would, would minimize the desire for nicotine. Science knows that your skin is an organ, you need to know that it's an organ, all right? So the mind must be renewed that, number one, I'm not going to accept that this has to be the rest of my life, right? I'm glad that the Bible is filled with examples of people that had seasons of feeling downcast. And, you know, Elijah, you know, Elijah, after having a great battle, uh, went into a state of depression. Woe is me. There's nobody. It's just me, Lord. And by the way, God didn't uh, condemn him for having those feelings, but he also didn't uh, listen to his pity party. You know, D D Elijah was there like, I'm the only one. There's no other Christians in America. Everybody is carnal. There's no one but me, Lord. And God's like, listen, I, I have 7,000 that have not bowed to Baal. You may not know who they are. So get out of that state of that pity party thinking it's only you in the battle. Uh, by the way, that's some of the reasons why God's people end up feeling discouraged. You know, by the way, um, I think one of the biggest things that causes depression is the news. Turn off the news. You'd probably get rid of 20 to 25 percent of your anxiety, if not more. Turn off the news. Uh, what you watch, what I watch, what we read, what we hear does affect us. So the first place you have to start is you need to start, I'm going to say, with renewing the mind. And renewing the mind changes our life, and, and we must renew the mind by constantly reading the Word of God. Now, how many of you, I'm going to ask this question. Yes, Spurgeon suffered with depression. Yep, I, we talked about that yesterday, Joel. Spur, Spurgeon suffered with it. And uh, if you read his writings, uh, he never became comfortable with it. You know, he never accepted like this is, you know, I have to, this is going to be, he, he treated it as an enemy and fought against it. And that's the point I want to make here. But how many of you read your Bible every day? How many of you read your Bible every day? I'm going to go even further. How many of you meditate on the scriptures every day? Because reading the Bible is one thing. Meditating on it is another. Um, I, I, again, one of the things that have been surprising to me uh, is the amount of God's people that don't read their Bibles every day. And, I, you know, here's what I've heard from people. I don't have time. And so one of the things I used to do, um, thank you, Linda, you stop watching the news. I catch, what you, catch what's important. Yep, that's good for you. Uh, Linda, read every day. Good. See, the Bible says that we are sanctified by the word. The, 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 uh, Jesus said to the disciples, uh, sanctify them to, to God. He's praying to the Father. He says, sanctify them through thy through thy truth, thy word is truth. That sanctifying there has to do with separating, but it also has to do with cleansing and washing. If you're going to deal with depression and discouragement and so on, one of the first places you have to begin is renewing the mind, and you cannot renew your mind if you're not reading the word of God. You need to read good books. Awesome. You need to read devotional books. Awesome. Read Charles Spurgeon's Morning and Even Evening. Awesome. But there is nothing that renews the mind like scripture. The entrance of your word gives light, scripture says. You know what depression is? It's a state of darkness. The soul feels oppressed and you feel downcast and you need the light to break forth. And that's not going to come without reading the scriptures. So I've often, as I met people who said, you know, well, I don't have time to read the Bible every day. I've had a few people I've challenged it. I said, how many of you would read the Bible at least 15 minutes a day, 20 minutes, 30 minutes a day, if I told you I'd give you $1,000 for every day you read the Bible for 15 minutes or more? And all of a sudden, that person who did not have, did not have time is able to find time. How do you find time? You make it. All of us have 24 hours in a day. You make time. You make time for things that are important to you. 
The person who says, I don't have time, but has a time, has time if someone promises them $1,000 for every, let's say an hour. If you spend a half an hour in the Word, half an hour, if you spend a half hour in the Word today, if someone said to you, I'll give you $1,000 for every day that you consistently read and meditate on the Scriptures for a half an hour. I bet most people who really believe in that promise of $1,000 every day would read the Bible every day. And so you're, you're going to continue to deal with depression and discouragement until you make time for the scriptures. You have to meditate, read the word every day because it's a way to wash you with the word. So you have to constantly read the word of God. Otherwise, you're going to think, act, and talk just like the rest of the world. Notice what I said. Think, act, and speak like the rest of the world. I believe there's life and death in the power of the tongue. You know, the scripture says that. I believe you can keep the things you say have a lot to do with how you feel and how you think. And the only way to change what you say and how you act, how I act, and how we think is to use the Word of God. So as your mind or your way of thinking is changed, you will begin to see things as God sees them. And your outward behavior will change. And you don't believe this is true. You know, you can feel depressed and discouraged for no reason at all. And, um, and there's nothing really that's gone wrong. And so what should you do? Should you just kind of accept that and wait until it passes? Or should you deal with it as an enemy and fight against it? I think you should fight against it. You know, the psalmist, we read Psalm 77 earlier, and that was Asaph. And he's, he's a, a writer uh, of, of hymns and songs in the Bible. Well, Asaph in Psalm 73 um, sounds like a man who is completely depressed and discouraged. Listen to his words. He says, truly God is good, at, good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. You hear what he says? God is good to all the Christians and all of Israel. He's good to everybody else, but not to me. God is good. Have you ever felt that way? Well, this is Asaph. He says, God is good to, to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. For I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. At least he acknowledged part of why he was feeling the way he did. Right? He says, For there are no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men. In other words, Asaph is saying, I'm the only one in, that gets in trouble. The bad things happen to me. Bad things don't happen to other people. He's looking at other people's lives who, from his perspective, they're not having the same trouble that he's having. And he's envious. He is becoming bitter. And this guy is discouraged. And now he's complaining before God. Their eyes stand out with fatness. They have more than heart could wish. They're prospering and I'm not. They are corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. Right? They're doing evil and they're still prospering. Right? This is a man who is full, full of envy. Good morning, Kimberly. Good to see you this morning. They set their mouth against the heavens, and their tongue walketh through the earth. Therefore his people return hither. They say, how doth God know? In other words, he's describing the wicked, right? And he's saying the wicked are prospering. And the more he looks at them, the more envious he becomes, the more discouraged and filled with anxiety he becomes, and the more depressed he feels. And what I want you to notice, though, is nothing changes in his circumstances. Nothing changes, but he's going to make a declaration in a few minutes. He says in verse 13, Verily I have cleansed my heart in vain. I became a Christian in vain. What a waste, waste of time. I'm wasting my time going to church. I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocency. What a waste of time. The wicked are still prospering. The world is still doing well. They're not going through the same pains and sufferings and things that I am. He says, for all the day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning. He is interpreting all of his trouble as from the Lord. God, God is sovereignly in control and bringing all this trouble into my life. All right? God gets blamed for too much, by the way. You know, the earth is groaning right now. It's not blaming God for its groaning. You know what it's blaming for its groaning? Sin. The earth is groaning. And it's going to keep groaning. And the Bible says it will groan until the sons of God are glorified, until glorification. There will be earthquakes, volcanoes. There will be things in the creation and in earth 
And it will continue to groan and to suffer and travail. Not because God has sovereignly caused it to happen. No, it is a result of sin. And many of the things you and I experience are a result of sin. It may not be my sin. It could just be sin in the world. It could be sins of others. People do bad things to other people. That's sin. He says, if I say I will speak thus, behold, I should offend against the generation of the children. As you read this whole, if you read the first 15, 16 verses, this guy sounds really depressed and discouraged. He says, when I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. And then verse 17, verse 17 says, until I went into the sanctuary of God, sanctuary of God, then understood I their end. And, and he goes on to say, he was feeling all discouraged and depressed and the world is coming to an end and the wicked are prospering and, and, and God is bringing prob problems into my life and things for me are never getting any better. This is Mr. Pessimist on steroids. The ironic thing is God doesn't change his circumstances. Nothing outside of him changes except he goes to church that day. And all of a sudden, his feeling of discouragement, depression, his complaining goes away. My point here is, if that can happen by going to the house of God, it can happen daily by going to the Word of God, right? Going to the Word of God. So the first way to deal with, with anxiety and depression and discouragement is you need to renew your mind. And the only way to really change the mind is to change it with the Word of God. Right? You can watch good videos, listen to good teaching, preaching, but you need to meditate on the Word of God. Scripture says, the psalmist says, I've hid the, your word in my heart that I will not sin against you. Right? That gets into Scripture memory. So as your mind, your way of thinking has changed, you will begin to see things as God sees them, and your outward behavior will change. If you, as a child of God, fail to renew your mind, you will be open and vulnerable to depression, just like anyone else. If you fail to renew your mind, if you fail to pull out the sword of the Spirit, it's the Word of God. Remember, that's part of the armor, right? Ephesians 6, we're told to put on the whole armor of God. Well, part of that armor is the Word. It is the sword of the Spirit. Some would say it's the only offensive weapon. I say prayer and the Word. Because verse 18 of Ephesians 6 says, and with all prayer and supplication. I believe prayer and supplication is part of the armor as well. It's not six parts. Prayer and supplication is another part of the armor. So if you're going to deal with discouragement, anxiety, and depression, suicidal thoughts, you have to begin with the mind because feelings flow from thinking, right? Feelings flow from thinking. The way we feel is directly related to the way we think. Thoughts that we have, right? Just think about it. Why is it that people, you know, they get a... Um, They get concerned about, they, you know, uh, they start thinking about their inability to pay a bill, right? I have a bill I can't pay. All of a sudden, you start feeling discouraged. You start feeling downcast. Where does that come from? That feeling didn't just come from anywhere. It came from thoughts, right? So as you begin to think about your inability to take care of a, a specific thing, financially, let's say, the more you think on that, I always say that the, the thing you focus on gets bigger. And so if you continue to focus on your inability to take care of that bill, or your concern about the pain in your body, which you're not sure because it hasn't been diagnosed yet, and now you have all these thoughts about what it could be, excuse me, well, the more you do that, the more you're going to have the feelings. And so you have, you have to renew your mind. You must replace all thought patterns with God's thoughts. And that's described in Ephesians 4. Uh, this is one of my favorite verses. And by the way, uh, how many of you actually memorize the Bible? How many of you spend time memorizing Scripture? I think it's almost like a lost art or science now. Be renewed. Um, you know, memorizing the Word of God is one of the key ways to put off the old man. Listen to Ephesians 4. God says that you put off, put off concerning the former conduct or conversation the old man, verse 22 of Ephesians 4, which is corrupt according to deceitful lusts or desires. 
and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. So Romans 12 says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Ephesians 4 says, you need to put on different patterns of thinking. You need the bent of the thinking must now change. So, you, so God is not just concerned with us renewing the way our brain thinks. We need to be renewed in the bent of our thinking, the spirit of our mind. Right? So, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that you put on the new man. So to be renewed in the spirit of our mind, first of all, this is a, this is a command. Right? Uh, this is a obligation. This is not a suggestion. And uh, the idea is within our nature, we need to be renewed, right? And so if you're going to deal with, with discouragement and depression and these things, um, you want to become more of a soldier in the way that you think. And you have to replace, uh, be renewed in the spirit of the mind. And the Bible calls this having the mind of Christ, the mind of Christ. In Proverbs 4, Proverbs 4 shows us the connection between renewing the mind with the word of God and our health, and our emotions, or our heart, right? Um, you must retain God's word in your heart as well as in your mind, which means how you think affects your emotions. Let me say that again. So when you look at Proverbs 4, Proverbs 4 shows us the connection, right, between renewing the mind with the word of God and how our health and our emotions or our heart is affected. You and I must retain God's word in our hearts as well as in our mind, which means how we think affects our emotions. So we must keep God's word in the midst of our heart and keep or guard and watch over our hearts. And so in, in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, the Bible says, um, we are to guard our hearts with all diligence. Right? For out of the heart flows the issues of life. Verse 23 says this, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Out of, out of the heart flows the issues of life. Uh, look, listen to a few more texts here in Proverbs 4 to see the connection between the heart and the mind and the emotions. Um, scripture says here, um, which verse here can I read here? Which passage here? The way of the wicked, my son. Listen to, listen to uh, Proverbs 4, 20, 20. My son, attend to my words. Incline thine ear unto my sayings. Let them not depart from thy eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart. Don't let my words depart from your eyes. So put them on your wall, right? Put them on your refrigerator. Put them in places where you could see the scriptures, right? I have a scripture over my television, I will set no wicked thing before my eyes as a reminder not to watch certain things, right? So put the word of God in front of you so you can see it. Why? Because we are forgetful hearers. Don't depend on your memory alone. So he says, let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart. That means to memorize the scriptures, right? For they are life unto those that find them and health to all your flesh. See, the word of God is not just to renew the mind. It actually is health to the flesh and to the heart and to the emotional life. Then it goes on to say, keep your heart with all diligence, for out of the heart flows the, um, flows the issues of life. So the first thing I would say, if you're going to deal with discouragement, anxiety, depression, you need, to, you need to renew your mind. You need to look at what does the scripture say about these things, and how does God look at them? And uh, what should my attitude be toward them? And uh, one of the best ways to start is to make sure you're reading and meditating on the scriptures daily. Um, you know, there, there are lots of passages in scripture. The Bible commands us and challenges us to guard our hearts, to meditate on the word of God regularly. regularly. Um, you know, the... the Listen to, listen to verses, um, again, verse 23, verse, uh, hmm, Proverbs, keep them in the midst of thine heart. Keep them in the midst of thine heart. Keep them in the midst of thine heart. Again, very important, uh, very important thing. Uh, and I, again, this is something that may seem sort of, most Christians, if not all, know that we need to be renewed in our minds, that we need to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. 
But I don't know how many people think of that when they think of dealing with depression, discouragement, and so on. And so, as basic as this is, again, Romans 12, 2 says, you be transformed in any area of your life. If you want to transform your financial life, if you want to transform your parental life, if you want to transform your relationships, your marriage, if you want to transform your spiritual life, your emotional life, your physical life, the way to do it is to start with the mind. Be transformed by the renewing of the mind, the renewing of your mind. Uh, let me get ready to wrap up here. Any comments on that? Any comments or questions on that? Um, Evelyn, you're totally correct. The peace of God starts in the mind, right? The peace of God starts in the mind. Uh, and, it, and, and we're told that the peace of God that passes all understanding will rule and reign in our hearts. It's like an umpire. It guards over the heart, right? And so you're not going to get rid of these feelings until you change your thoughts. Again, we're going to talk more in the future about you know, how to change the diet and all those things. And maybe I'll talk about that tomorrow because your mindset needs to be changed in the way you think about what you eat and what you digest because all of that affects the mind. You can't separate, you can't separate the physical body from the thought life and vice versa. You're, you and I are whole beings. Um, Carly, Carly says, check it out. Let me know what you think. All right, I guess you're just tagging a friend. So you can't separate the physical and emotional and spiritual man. All, all of who and what we are go together. Uh, Peggy says, when I'm stuck in discouragement like now, it's so hard for me to read and retain what I'm reading. So I'm glad you mentioned that, Peggy. So um, it's hard to read, right? And I, and I agree with you. And, 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 and this is why I say you have to have the mindset of a soldier. Um, I've heard people say, you know, it's hard to read or it's hard to pray. And so they don't pray and they don't read when, it be, when it's hard. One of the sayings in my home that we teach our children is that doing things you don't like to do builds character. And the things we don't like to do are things that don't feel good, things that are not easy to do, things that are hard to do. And so the first thing I would say is I commend you uh, for choosing to read even when you don't feel like doing it. Um, you have to push through. You have to persevere. Uh, because sometimes those feelings are a spiritual attack from the enemy. Or it can be um, the, the mind has been trained to respond a certain way. This is why addictions are such a problem, right? The Bible says in Romans chapter 6, To whom you give your, yield yourself servants to obey, his servant you become. Listen to this in uh, Romans chapter 6. It says, um, Paul uses these words, and I think there's a good principles for us. Um, let's see if I can find it quick. Okay, Romans 6 verse 15. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? God forbid. Know you not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are. So in our walk with God, there's a sense of presenting ourselves, right, as a living sacrifice, right? That's a... That, that's a um, that's a, um, what's the word I'm looking for? That's a positive action. Presenting, it's a choice. It's a positive action. Yielding has like a negative action. I choose not to yield. I can yield to, to thoughts of, of, you know, negative thoughts. I can yield to temptation. I can yield to um, negative feelings. I don't feel like praying. I don't feel like reading. And this, again, is why I said earlier that when you're dealing with depression, discouragement, and anxiety, you have to strengthen the will because the will has to overcome the feelings and the emotions, right? And uh, the thing about the will, though, the more we yield our will to do what's wrong, the easier it becomes to do what's wrong. The more we yield our will to do what's right, the more it's easier to do what's right. So the first thing I would say is, even though you don't feel like reading, you don't feel like praying, Remember that the, that, that, that the person you yield to, the thing you yield to, becomes easier to yield. And so this is how this works. 
If I give in to, let's say, I don't feel like reading today, and so I decide I'm not going to read, then tomorrow it becomes easier not to read again, or the next time I have those feelings, it becomes easier not to do it. The reverse is also true. That even though I don't feel like doing it, even if I just choose to go through the motions, right, it becomes easier to do that the next time. So know you not that to whom ye, ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. So the first thing I would say is, yes, it is hard. Uh, it's hard, you say, to read and to retain what you're reading. Expect it to be hard at times because you're in a battle. You're in a war. You're in a war against your own, your own flesh. Right? You're in a war against the world, and you're in a war against the, the adversary of your soul. And, and neither of the three are going to make it easy for you to win this battle. And so we have to train ourselves, train, discipline. You have to discipline yourself to, uh, to do the right thing, uh, even when you don't feel like doing it. And so the first thing you do is you choose. I'm going to choose to read, even though I don't feel like it. And here's a practical thing you could do. All of you have cell phones. Um, maybe you're familiar with, uh, there's a lot of different apps. One of the apps that I use every day is YouVersion. And uh, I don't read the Bible anymore. I listen to the Bible as I read, right? So I let someone else read it to me and I listen, right? I find that when I'm listening uh, to the Bible being read and I'm looking at it on the pages that I retain more, right? So that's one of the things I would encourage you to do. The other thing I would encourage is, if you find that you're reading the Bible and it's hard to retain, then stay in the same passage and keep reading it every day. Let's say that you chose to read James 1 to 3 today and you got nothing out of it. Nothing out of it. I'm going to put it in quotes. Read the same three chapters tomorrow. Read them for 30 days. Um, God says, if you seek me with all of your heart, you'll find me. And this is a thing that I think a lot of God's people miss. We expect are seeking God. We're commanded, right, to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And sometimes we expect that process to be easy. And I'm going to say, no, don't expect it to be easy. It is to be very, very hard, very difficult. Um, God says you will, you'll find truth, wisdom, if you seek for it like you do for hidden treasure. So the two things you're dealing with there, Peggy, you're dealing with the desire to read and then the ability to retain what you read. The first thing I would say is, is develop the discipline to read and pray even when you don't feel like doing it. And maybe sometimes what you have to do is put on some music to set the environment, right? Sometimes you may have to listen to a message or something to kind of get you in the right frame of mind. I find that music for me is one of the big helpers. Um, you know, when I put on worship music, it kind of sets the atmosphere, all right? So... Um, but you, we have a lot of tools. I use uh, YouVersion. There's a lot of other Bible apps. Um, I will just turn on, you know, I listened to many chapters of the Bible this morning before I came on here. And so that would be my encouragement. Push through the feelings. Push through how you feel. Sometimes you don't feel like doing it. Sometimes you don't, uh, you don't feel like you got anything out of what you did. But that's why we're called disciples. Disciples, right? The... Uh, the disciples were first called Christian at Antioch. Um, the idea of us being called Christians, is, is, that's a bad term. Why? Because the term was used negatively in the Bible as a, um, it, it wasn't used positively. When people were called Christian, it was negative terms. Uh, to be a Christian is to be Christ-like, but it sort of lost its meaning. And sometimes we don't think of being disciples. Um, uh, again, Evelyn, that app is uh, YouVersion. It's a YouVersion, Y-O-U, version, Bible app. And um, it's a great app. Uh, I've used it for, wow, years, five, six, seven, eight, ten years. Um, I use it every day. And uh, again, uh, we have a lot more distractions today, so use the tools. There's nothing wrong with using the tools that are available. Use the tools that are available. It's going to help you. Um, God doesn't have a problem with you using tools to help you enjoy your devotion time, your reading time. And by the way, some people have a difficulty with reading the scriptures because they don't understand what they're reading. And again, I would say there, um, pick a passage or a book of the Bible and read it every day for 30 days. For example, Philippians is 133 verses, right? 
133 verses, uh, 33 times the, the word rejoice or joy or rejoicing, the phrase is used. Um, that book, uh, I, I, I preached on it years ago and I called it... Um, uh, the Divine Remedy to Life's Disappointments, something like that. Um, um, joy in Christ. Joy in Christ, the Divine Remedy to Life's Disappointments. If you're dealing with depression, you know what's a good... Um, if I was a pharmacist, like a Christian pharmacist or a doctor, and I wanted to prescribe something for you, for the next 30 days, read the book of Philippians every day. Don't read any other parts of the Bible uh, in your own devotion time. Read Philippians. It's four chapters. Uh, you can get through, by the way, if you want to read through the whole Bible, you could read through the whole Bible 15 minutes a day. In one year, you'll go through the whole Bible 30 minutes a day. You'll go through the whole Bible twice in a year. And so a lot of times people don't do stuff because they don't know. They think I need to spend a whole lot of time. I'm telling you, 15 minutes a day in the scriptures, you'll get through the whole Bible in one year. But back to Philippians. Uh, you could read through the whole book of Philippians, 15 to 20 minutes a day. You could read through the whole book in one day, All right? Depending on how fast you read. By the way, that's another reason I love the apps, because the app goes at a certain speed, and all you have to do is listen and follow along. I like to follow along with an open Bible. By the way, here's a another nugget. Um, I don't depend totally on devices. Um, I don't think people should just use their devices in church. I think it's a bad habit to develop. I think you should have a Bible so you can write in it, highlight it, you can make notes, you can, if you have a great outline that your pastor spoke on, uh, since you're a forgetful hero, by, within a week you're going to forget what was preached last week, that's normal, and so how do you retain, how do you transform your mind if you're not retaining this stuff? You need to write things down, you need to go over it again and again so that you can retain it, so um, my encouragement is uh, use the apps, but have an open Bible with you so you can highlight and write in it and make notes um, because that's going to help you. But if I was dealing with depression and I was counseling myself right now, my counsel to myself would be for the next 30 days, read every day through the book of Philippians. Ideally, I would say read four chapters a day because it's only four chapters. And first of all, by day three or four, you're going to feel good. If you've never done something like this before, you're going to just feel good for, for keeping your commitment. Like, if, Let's say you made a simple commitment to, to go to the gym every day. By day four or five of consistently going to the gym, you're going to feel endorphins. You're going to have positive emotions just for committing to do it. The reverse is true. If you commit to doing it, you made the commitment too big and you don't, and you don't follow through on the commitment, you're going to feel those negative emotions. All right? So... If I were in your position and I was dealing with anxiety and depression and discouragement, first thing I would do is committing, commit to reading the book of Philippians. Why? Because it's filled with joy and rejoicing in those four words and phrases. Plus, chapter 2 says, we are, to, we are to let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. That's where we are told about having the mind of Christ in Philippians chapter 2. By the way, I believe, I believe the majority of popular scriptures are found in the book of Philippians. Right? I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. Philippians 4.13 Being confident of this very thing, that he that began the good work in you will complete it. Philippians 1 verse 6 Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Philippians 3 verse 3 um, Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things have good report, if there be any virtue, any praise, think on these things. Philippians 4, 7 and 8 um, You'll be surprised how many verses you know come right out of the book of Philippians. So if I were in your position and I was dealing with depression and discouragement, I would begin today, even if I've had my devotions already, before I go to bed tonight, I would read those four chapters. And then tomorrow I would do the same thing. And the next day I would do the same thing. And here's what I promise you. Let me give you one last nugget before I leave. A couple weeks ago I did a series, not a series, I did a talk on um, what the church community can learn from the Jewish community about economics, finances, entrepreneurship, and so on and so on. Why the Jewish community is so successful financially. All right? The Jewish community owns Google, they own Facebook, they own PayPal, Starbucks, 
Um, we can go down the list of what um, is owned by the Jewish community. Much of Hollywood is influenced and owned. Banking industry, on and on and on and on we can go. And uh, since I'm an entrepreneur and I'm, you know, I'm a kind of person I like to look at what are people doing? Why are they successful? So here's one of the things that the Jewish community uh, understands and do uh, that the church community doesn't understand, in my opinion, from my experience. And I've been a Christian for more than 25 years. Uh, around the Bible, around the people of God for more than 40 years. You know, I grew up in church. But anyway, uh, one of the things that they understand, uh, they have a saying in the Talmud, uh, which is one of the writings in the Jewish community, that they are taught to read the same thing over and over again and expect to see something different every time. Did you get that? That's not how Romans and Greeks think. See, you and I think like Romans and Greeks. Greeks and Romans, uh, wisdom is a big thing, right? Not wisdom, knowledge is a big thing. And there's the thinking like, well, I already know that already. I know that, right? You ever talk to your kids? Daddy, I know. Mommy, I know. That's Greek thinking. That's, 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 uh, that's Roman thinking, right? And I use those two to describe, you know, the New Testament was written under a Roman era, the Roman and Greek era, right? So... Uh, by the way, the New Testament writers, the majority of them thought like Hebrews, not like Greeks. And so uh, when, when James says, show me your works, I'll show you my faith by my works. James was saying true faith is a verb. It has action. It's not a noun. True faith is a verb. It's a faith is a substance of things hoped for. It's, it has action by faith. By faith, Noah did such and such. By faith, Abraham did such and such. He believed. By faith, right? He obeyed and so on. So back to my point. Uh, you'd be shocked how much you would learn and how much insight you would get. The entrance of thy word gives light. That's insight. The light bulb turns on. When the light turns on, you have light in your soul. You feel empowered. Discouragement and depression and these negative thoughts go away. Read the scriptures every day. And expect to see something different every time you read. By the way, this is biblical. Psalm 119. The psalmist says, Open thou mine eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. Open my eyes. He goes through the Bible praying, asking God. So, by the way, I'm assuming you do this. When you read the Bible, you pray before you read it. Ask God to open it to your heart. Right? That's one of the reasons many people don't understand the scriptures. Because they treat it like they're reading a newspaper or a novel. So there's that little nugget there that the Jewish community is taught from very young. Read the same thing, expecting to see something different the next time you read it. Um, I've read through, I've gone through the book of Ephesians now. In the last, the book of Ephesians, I've read almost every day for the last, I've read the book of Ephesians more than 100 times now in the last two years. Right? It's one of my commitments is to memorize the whole book of Ephesians. Right? And so one way to do that is to just read it over and over and over and over again. I remember reading um, or hearing about a minister, a pastor who was a, a um, I'm going to end here. I keep saying I'm going to end. But he was a um, professor in a college. And he would stand up in front of his college and quote whole books of the Bible. Like in his 70s and 80s. And the kids can understand. Like, Professor, how were you able to quote the whole book of John? I'm not talking about four chapter books and five chapter books. And he had a habit. He would read through, before he preached any book of the Bible, he would read, he would commit to reading through it, I think, 50 times. Right? 50 times he would read through the whole book. So, so again, I'm sharing all of this because the mindset of many of God's people is, well, I've read John 3.16. I don't need to look at that again. If someone gets up and says, turn to your Bibles to John 3.16. The average person don't open their Bible anymore. I know that already. You don't know something biblically, Hebrew mindset, until you're doing it. And so if you know it in your head, but it's not seen in your living, you don't know it yet. Because we have to know it in our hearts. See, we don't understand enough of the subconscious part of who we are. The unconscious part of who we are. See, that, that's the part that has to be changed, right? And so think of it this way. You go out and you buy a car. Let's say that you, for the first time, I remember a few years ago, we bought a black um, Toyota Highlander, right? A few years ago, they were like new, uh, it was like the new versions, 
And um, I hadn't seen I had I hadn't seen a black I hadn't seen a I, I don't think I'd ever seen a black toy, Toyota Toyota uh, Highlander up until that point. And then after I bought it, everywhere I went, I saw black black Toyota to, Toyota Highlanders. I saw Highlanders everywhere I went, black ones. What happened? I became conscious of it, right? And so, um, in the same way, uh, there's a subconscious part of us that is not always alert and aware of things, and all of a sudden you become aware and alert. Well, in the same way, from the Bible, if you're going to deal with anxiety and depression, you need to start with renewing the mind. I'm saying you're not going to renew the mind without using the Word of God. And if you're struggling to get stuff from the Word of God, then keep reading it. And it's okay. Uh, I, I would... If I was dealing with depression, rather than committing to read through the whole Bible in a year, I would commit to reading through one book a month and read that every day for that month, right? And so my encouragement to you is don't expect it to be easy. Don't expect the feelings to just go away, right? Saul's experience, Saul's negative feelings didn't just go away. David had to come every day and play for him. By the way, I don't know if you know this, David didn't just play once, one day, and all of a sudden, uh, Saul was cured if you are not uh, reading the scriptures on a regular basis. You need to get rid of the thoughts that come from the world, the flesh, and the devil, and replace those thoughts with the Word of God. You have to replace it with the Word of God. You know, and here is, here is how you know when your mind has been changed. Um, when you're, let's say you're using a hammer and you hit your finger. And the first thing you do is, Lord Jesus, you've been changed. If the first thing that comes out is mother, and you, you know, some F words and bombs, whatever, subconsciously, that part of you has not been changed yet. And what I mean by that is, what you do naturally under stress and pressure is who and what you really are at the core of who you, who you are. Hear that again. What you do naturally, unconsciously, at the core of who you are, under stress and pressure, is who you really are. And that's not a negative, that's not a condemnation. That's the idea that I have to be changed in that area. When you get cut off in traffic and then the first thing that comes out of your mouth is to curse somebody out, that means you have to put off the old man. The old man is still there, right? Thank God you're saved, right? Hopefully you've been changed by the grace of God and you've given yourself over to Him. But now you need to be renewed in the spirit of your mind, the inner man has to be transformed. You have to put off the old man and put on the old man, and that requires effort. And so when your natural disposition is to praise God, is to be thankful, and I'm not saying we don't have seasons, all right? Juno had a season where he felt depressed. There's people in Scripture, Naomi went through a, a serious season, Right, And you look at what she named her child. Uh, she was depressed. Her soul was depressed. And so what, we're talking about two different things. I'm talking, first of all, with people that, that you feel anxiety, you feel discouraged, uh, that sort of thing, and, and you don't feel motivated. I'm saying fight through that. Okay? Then there are people who have those seasons, right? And maybe you need to, uh, this is where you, another practical thing to do is confess your faults one to another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. Find a partner, someone that you can share your struggle with, who can pray with you. All right? So maybe you're in such a better place than you was when you were lazy and wasn't reading every day. Yeah. And see, it's good that you acknowledge that as being lazy. Because a lot of times people take labels and they feel okay and justified by the label. You know? Uh, and so that's why you have to be careful. But see, when you take responsibility for it, then you can change it. And so when you identify it as being lazy, you're taking responsibility and you can choose now to do something about it. All right. So anyway, first step in dealing with these things is you need to start re with renewing the mind. And uh, maybe tomorrow, Lord willing, uh, I'll go deeper into this idea of renewing the mind. Um, but turn off the news. Turn off the news. Some of you have to have to be careful uh, of who you're connected with. On Facebook, I've had to delete some Facebook friends because of some of the things they post on their timeline, right? And I'm like, you know what? I can't control my timeline. I mean, I can control my timeline, right? Whoever you are associated with and connected with is going to determine what you see on your timeline. And so if people are posting things on their timeline that's showing up on your timeline, 
that you don't want to see. Like, like I'm tired of seeing politics. I'm tired of seeing stuff about gun laws. And I'm, I'm, I, I'm like, I'm committed now. I'm not posting anything else for a while. Because we're not going to change. You're not going to change the mind of anyone that differs with you. Uh, it, you're not going to. The mind is not that easily changed. That's why the Bible says we're to be transformed by the renewing of our mind, showing that there's an effort and work and time right, that has to be put in to have the mind change. So it's not going to be changed with 10 minutes of dialogue back and forth in a post. So anyway, be smart, be wise, guys. This is Daily Nuggets of Wisdom. Uh, Lord willing, tomorrow we're going to go, da go deeper into being uh, transformed by the renewing of the mind. And uh, if I remember, I'll, talk, I'll give some suggestions and recommendations of books you can read uh, in relation to health and other stuff because you cannot separate the physical body uh, the emotional state, the spirit man, we're a whole man, whole being, whole person. And you can't separate those things, all right? And if you're going to deal with anxiety and depression and suicidal thoughts and so on, uh, you have to eliminate a lot of the chemicals that you're taking into your body as well. Uh, especially women, you have a lot of hormonal, hormonal issues. You have hormonal problems anyway, um, you know, all these other things being added to it only makes it can, can make things worse. So maybe we'll we'll get into some of that. All right. God bless you all. Thanks for hanging around and um, have a good day.